I want you to notice my text. The Bible said in Ephesians 6 and verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And so from the offset, you'll see that we're not in a battle uh, against man against man. He's not talking about that which you see and that which I handle, but Paul is talking about a battle for the Christian in an unseen world. Now you somebody say, why, Brother Mays, if it's unseen, do you know it's real? Let me tell you, this thing is real. These demons, this demon activity, they're real. Why, somebody said, well, if you can't see them, how do you know they're real? I can't see the power of God. But I want to tell you, I know it's real. When the Holy Ghost begins to bless me, I know I can't see God move, but I can feel the mighty power of God. Why, I can see the joy of the Lord. But when the Lord squeezes my heart and juice runs out my eyes, and when I get over in a glory path, brother, why, you can say it's not real all you want to. But I'm glad I know the joy of the Lord. And you can't see it, but you can know it. And when a man comes up to you or a person and denies this revival of demon activity, just because it's of the unseen world, and when a person says, there is no such thing as a demon, my friend, you'd better wake up. We're living in a revival of demons. Somebody said, what is a demon? It's a fallen angel that repelled that thunder with Satan. It's a disembodied spirit. You cannot destroy a demon. Demons are by the millions. Demons are in the army of Satan. And my friend, did you know the powers of darkness are beginning to settle all over this world? Now, for you, I want to give you the difference between demon possession and oppression. A Christian cannot be demon possessed. My Bible says in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 4 that we're sealed by the Holy Ghost until the day of redemption. I'm glad. Praise God, I've been sealed. Praise God, preserved in the Holy Ghost. Now, Christians are not possessed, but they can be oppressed. They can feel these strange powers, uh, rebuking them. Have you ever felt the strange powers of Satan in the church? Have you ever tried to get up and sing your breeze uh, and feel the pressure of demon power? Uh, you say, what is that? That's oppression. Or uh, uh, you can be tormented by these demons. Uh, three ways uh, that a demon can attack the Christian. And then I'll get in and name seven demons uh, that are invading you and invading Chattanooga. First of all, demons can oppress the mind. Uh, my Bible tells me that we're to let this same mind uh, be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, now, that's your only way I know uh, to keep the demons out of your mind. Uh, everything, brother, today's geared to demonism. Uh, everything you see, everything you hear. Uh, and my friend, if you're not careful, uh, the devil and demons will attack your mind. Uh, and then secondly, demons will attack your body. Uh, oh, listen, have you ever felt strange in your body, uh, your skin crawling? Uh, my friend, demons can attack your body. Uh, and then thirdly, demons can attack your nerves. Uh, I've seen some of the greatest preachers in the last few years uh, with the nervous conditions uh, some of the greatest Christians I've ever met uh, have had nerve trouble uh, and you say what's wrong preacher uh, they are being oppressed by demons uh, and demons would have you have your nerves to collapse uh, but I'm glad for that verse it says uh, he'll keep your mind in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on God uh, brother there is such a thing uh, as the Holy Ghost taking care of your nerves uh, the word of God can take care of your nerves uh, I I know folks say, well, preacher, I'm nervous. Ask God to take care of your nerves. Ask God to rebuke these demons that would torment you. Now, if you have your pencils, I want you to jot these demons down. I'll name them one by one, and I trust that you listen. First of all, the Bible talks about rebellion, and that's a, re that's a demon. Somebody said, are you sure? If you'll turn to 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, the Bible said rebellion is as witchcraft. Uh, and witchcraft is a demon. I'll show you about it in just a moment. Uh, but you say, what about this rebellion? Uh, before I get into this demon of rebellion, let me talk about what's the other side. The Bible said, blessed are the meek, uh, for they shall inherit the earth. <laughs> Woo! I like that. Bless God. Uh, one of these days, we're going to inherit the earth. Uh, I know the post don't believe that. 
that, but I believe in it. I believe we're coming back, glory to God. On, and it's going to be wonderful. We're going to rule and reign with Jesus a thousand years upon the earth. You know, I lived in Atlanta, and they won't never call me. Really, they never called me about any of the clubs and all of that. But one day, a lady made a mistake, and she called me, and she said, Hello, is this Dr. Jackson? I said, No, ma'am. This is Brother Mays. Oh, she said, is this Reverend Jackson? I said, no, ma'am, this is Brother Mays. And she said, Brother? <laughs> and I said, yes, this is Brother Mays. I said, can I help you? She said, I, I'm from the DeKalb uh, Saddle Club, and we want to invite you to enjoy, uh, or to join the DeKalb uh, Saddle Club. I said, sister, you're too late. I've already joined the Saddle Club. And she said, what? Which one do you belong to, Mr. Jackson? I said, I belong to that one in Revelation 19, where it said, We'll come back on white horses, uh, praise God, uh, and we'll rule and reign with Jesus uh, a thousand years. Uh, you say, Brother Mays, I don't believe that. My Bible said, if we suffer for him, uh, we shall also reign with him. Uh, but if it's talking about God's children, the meek. Uh, I love to preach about Moses, uh, the meekest man on earth. Uh, one of the great needs of our churches is the need of meekness uh, instead of rebellion, uh, instead of that spirit of rebellion. Uh, if you'll turn over in second. And Samuel chapter 15, you'll find a boy named Absalom. And Absalom rebelled against his father David. Did you know Absalom was the first hippie in the Bible? Oh, you say, I don't read that. Well, you read it in that same chapter. You know what the Bible said? And his hair was so long uh, until they weighed his hair. Uh, now, let me stop long to say this. Uh, long hair is a sign of rebellion. Uh, it's not a sign looking like Jesus uh, because Jesus didn't have long hair. Uh, Jesus never contradicted the word of God. Uh, he came to fulfill it, uh, not to destroy it. Uh, and he says over in uh, Paul talking to the church at Corinth, uh, he said, does it not even nature teach you? Uh, it's shame for a man to have long hair. I believe that roll my heart. And yet today we have people saying, well, I want to look like a disciple. I want to look like Jesus. I'll let my hair grow long. I believe this, brother, if you want to look like Jesus, you'll get your hair cut and you'll look like a Christian all of us. Who wants to look like a hippie? Who wants to look like something that's got down here on the street? Listen, we ought to want to look right for the Lord Jesus Christ. But this long hair is the mark of rebellion. And I want to say something else while I'm on this. Uh, these mini skirts, bless your heart, is a their marks a rebellion. Uh, these women that don't want to dress modestly and dress like a Christian on a dress. Uh, bless God, they want to run around here and come to church in this. Uh, now I want to stop wrong to say this. I'm honest with you here. I can understand why a girl would want to go to a nightclub in a mini skirt. I can understand why a woman of the street would want to wear mini skirts, but I can't understand why a woman would want to come to my house of God and stand in the choir and sing in the ministers. I can't understand it to save my life. I can understand a man out here in business wanting to get more business and let his hair grow long, but I can't understand some of these quartets to save my life. I can't understand some of these preachers to save my life. Run around here with this long hair and profess to know God and love Jesus. Brother, I want to tell you something. It's the mark of rebellion. Now, that's a demon, a demon of rebellion. Somebody said, what are they rebelling against? Let me give you two things and we'll go on to the next demon. They're rebelling first against the word of God. My Bible said in the last days they had not endured sound doctrine, but would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You let a preacher preach it as it is in Chattanooga, and brother, they'll ride him out on a pole. Did you know that? You let a preacher get up and say, this is what God says, and I'm going to preach it. I get so tired of these folks coming and saying, why don't you preach like Jesus? All right, let me give you a little a sermon by Jesus. Uh, you know what he said? He said, you open graveyards, you open sepulchre, you dead men's bones, uh, you're, you're corrupt, uh, twofold children of hell. Uh, and brother, you talk about taking hides off. Uh, when Jesus preached, brother, he, he didn't spare it. Uh, oh, I hear somebody, why don't you preach like Jesus? Uh, brother, he, he took the hide off. Let me tell you something. You'll never find where Jesus uh, ever compromised with sin. Uh, you'll never find where Jesus uh, ever compromised with the Pharisees uh, and the scribes uh, and those people of his day. Uh, 
fact, he came out and said the truth as it was. And we need to preach the word of God. But the Bible said there'll be rebellion. They'll not endure the word of God. I'm glad old Paul said to Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. As long as God gives me breath and as long as I stay in this mind, I'm going to preach what the word of God says about the new birth, about the blood, about separation, about the Holy Ghost. That'll scare some of you Baptists to death when you get to talk about the Holy Ghost. Now, I want to tell you, bless God, I believe you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't you believe that? Yes, sir. Somebody said it'll make you act funny. No, it'll make you act decently in an order. But your cup will run over and your saucer will get blessed. And brother, we need the Holy Ghost in the same time. I know some little fundamental preachers over America, and they're so fundamental until they cross every T, and I believe I do too. And they dot every I, and I do too. But they're dead. Listen, if they get up and preach and somebody's shouting in their church, it's come to death. If somebody got to crying, oh, let me tell you, they'll have an usher to usher them out of the house of God. I tell you, I believe the Bible when it says that well, the, letter, the letter of the law is to kill us, but the Spirit quicken us and make us alive. And bless God, I'm not ready for the graveyard yet. I'm alive. I belong to the resurrection of the life club. I'm glad, praise the Lord. We can have something that lets the world know that we are alive. Hallelujah, the Lamb. I always ride airplanes. About 1965, I got on an airplane, little old, uh, little old guy sitting on the other side. I took out my Bible, started reading it out of my briefcase. He looked at me and said, Ooh. And I said, Ooh. He said, Did you know, you don't know who I am? And I said, Bless God, you don't know who I am either. He said, I'm an astronaut. Because I, I call him astronauts. You can call him what you want to. But he said, I'm an astronaut. <laughs> I said, I'm a Holy Ghost Baptist preacher. Boy, that likes to scare him. That's sure enough. And he said, but you know, I have a good time. <laughs> and I said, you know, I have a good time too, praise the Lord. He said, did you know I've been chosen to be one of the first ones to land on the moon? And so I asked him, and that was way back. I said, when is the date, sir? He said, we're scheduled to land on the moon in 1970. I believe they beat it a year, sir. But he said, that's when we're, and he said, oh, he said, do you know of anything more exciting than when I land on the moon? I said, just one thing, brother. He said, what? I said, say you land on the moon 1970, and the rapture takes place in 71. I said, you wave as I pass by, because glory to God, I'm not stopping on the moon. I want to tell you, I know something more exciting. I'm going past the moon. Brother, I'm saved, and I know the Lord Jesus. But I tell you, there's the spirit of rebellion against the word of God, and then the spirit of rebellion against the Holy Spirit. People are not willing to follow the leadership of the spirit. My Bible said in Romans, as many as are led by the Spirit. They are the sons of God. Now, I know preachers are led by their wives. Amen. I know preachers are led by a bunch of deacons and they can preach. I know some brother led by the denomination and some little big shot. But brother, we ought to be led by the Spirit of God. And I just right. That's a I used to have a fellow in my church. His name was King. He's led by his wife. Anything I can't stand for, Kim Peck's husband. Amen, say amen. Some of you men are looking down. Homer like went on the beach just then when I missed That's right. Amen, that's right. I, I'd get up and I'd start to preach and I'd say, now, Tuesday night I'm going so-and-so. Thursday night I'll be preaching a certain place I need a man to drive me. And I asked him, oh, oh, Brother King would come up after And he'd say, hey, Brother Nays. I'd say, God bless you, Brother King. I said, can you drive me? He said, well, if it's the Lord's will, I'll drive you. I said, well, go ask Ines and find out if it's God's will and come back and tell him. <laughs> and he'd go ask Ines and come back like a little bit dog. He'd say, Brother Nish. He'd say, it ain't the Lord's will. <laughs> I'd say, all right, God help you. One Sunday morning, I was preaching on the horn, and I was going down. I said, let's take the man's responsibility. Now I looked over and I said, Brother King, I said, you need to go home and let old Ines know who's boss. And the next day I went in Brother Nelson's store to get some milk and bread for my wife for breakfast. And he came in with a big patch over his eye. And he said, I'm not speaking to you, Brother Mays. I said, let me tell you something. I said, you better speak. 
He said, I want you to know it may work up there where you're preaching, but where I live, bless God, it just don't work. He said, I want to do that. But all oh, the Bible said we're not to be led by flesh and blood, but we're to be led by the Spirit of God. There's the spirit of rebellion. Now let's speak to the second demon. Not only the demon of rebellion, but there's a second demon. It's called the demon of fear. My Bible said in 2 Timothy, listen, verse uh, 7 of chapter 1, listen what he says. God does not give you the spirit of fear, but he gives you the spirit of, of power and love and a sound mind. Uh, brother, we're not to be afraid. We need Christians today. They're not afraid, but we're living in a fearful age. Uh, if you'll turn to the book of the Revelation, the Bible said in chapter 21 in verse 8, that the fearful will be cast into hell. That's what it's talking, describing sinners. But we're living in a fearful age in which we now live. People are afraid everywhere you turn. People are afraid to live and they're afraid to die. They're afraid to buy and they're afraid to sell. They're afraid to get up at night and they're afraid to go to bed. We're living in an age of jitters. I've never seen so much fear in all of my life. And the Lord Jesus said one of the signs that will accompany the coming of Jesus. Uh, men's hearts failing them for fear. But if you're a Christian on this Sunday afternoon, thank God you can have a peace uh, that'll take that fear away. Uh, and you can have a deep, settled peace. Uh, Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world give, but I give this peace. Uh, and said, bless God, it'll pass all understanding. It'll take the fear away from you. Uh, if you'll turn in your Bible a second, uh, Second Samuel 23, when you get home, read it, you know what it says? Saul finally committed suicide. But you know what the matter King Saul? He was afraid. He was so afraid of somebody stealing his popularity until when they'd come and tell him about David and David's victories. Oh, and you're going to kill him. Reason some of these preachers in Chattanooga and Atlanta, Georgia, gripe when some of the churches blessed. They're afraid that church is going to steal a little bit of the glory that they want. They don't want anybody to be blessed. You know, that's, brother, that's selfishness. And we got a lot of people that are afraid God will bless somebody else. I want to tell you, if God don't bless me, I hope he blesses you. And if he blesses you, I'll get a little bit. It'll run off on me. And if it doesn't, I'll shout anyway because God blesses you. We got fear all over the place. Old Samuel, uh, he had to, used to come in and play for Saul. He was so afraid he couldn't go to sleep at night. He was so afraid he'd, they'd have to play music and, and all this to get him to go to sleep at night. He, uh, I was in the middle hospital uh, visiting a friend, and I went in that hospital. I said to the doctor, I said, Doctor, why are most people here? He said, e either directly or indirectly. You listen to me. And the next time liquor comes up in Chattanooga to vote, I don't care what kind of liquor they vote on, buy the drink or buy the bottle, bottle in the barn or bottle uh, in barn. You vote against it. Amen? Amen? That's right. Same old stuff. It's rotten. as torment itself. It'll cause a man to beat his family. It'll cause a man to become insane. Now you stand against it. But anyway, I went in the scene. I said, this doctor, he said 75% of the people here in this mental hospital are either here directly or indirectly, rather, because of alcohol. And he said, people don't know. They, they say, it's all right to take a little liquor. I want to tell you something. When you get right with God, you'll change families. When you get saved, praise God. You'll get out of the liquor drinking business. I'm glad there's something about it. But I said to him, I said, what's wrong with these folks? He said, they're afraid. He said, now watch them when we walk up here. They jump and they're afraid. He said, it's the spirit of this age. My friend, did you know there's a demon called fear? But God can give you peace in the midst of fearfulness and, and anxiety and trouble. There's that second demon, fear. Now the third demon is violence. And you've never heard of as much violence in your life. All this business, I don't care if they do say it's under peaceful coexistence. And they're hollering about Vietnam. And they're marching up and down the streets and breaking out window lights. Listen to me, violence is wrong in any form or fashion. Because God condemns violence. And I don't care if they do get up and I hear not what they say. Violence is always a terrible thing. You're going to hear more about violent people. You're going to hear about women taking their babies and, uh, and severing the, the baby's heads from their bodies. Uh, you're going to hear about men coming in and killing the whole family. In fact, you're already 
hearing about such violence. When a man gets drunk and a woman gets drunk, usually they get violent. You're going to hear about all this in these last days. There is the demon of violence. Say, where is it found in the Bible? Mark 5 said there was a man that cried in the day and he cried in the night. And the scripture said he slept in a graveyard. Brother, you've got to be weird to sleep in a graveyard. Did you know that? Somebody said, I don't even go to graveyard in daytime. Let's rest night. I want to tell you, somebody said, oh, but you don't respect the dead. I belong to the resurrection and the life club. And bless God, why should I hang around the dead all the time? I want you to know I'm looking for Jesus to come. And I believe the trumpet's going to sound. But these folks that always talk about, well, I hang around the graveyard. The Bible said that man stayed over there. Now, let me tell you something. I was down at uh, a little motel to see a Galilee a couple years ago. And uh, there's a lady over there, and she's really, oh, she's real nice, you know. I mean, uh, and she taught in the University of Pennsylvania. And her husband said to me, said, uh, Mr. Jackson, said, uh, she is a very religious woman, but she doesn't believe in the miracles. I said, uh, 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 uh. And said she doesn't believe that the Bible's divinely inspired. And then he asked me a question. He said, do you believe in this second birth? I said, Mr., I've had that second birth. And he invited a friend over and said, meet Mr. Jackson. He's one of them second time around guys. And I said, you're right. First time was a mess. Last time is Jesus. Glory to God. First time I was born of the flesh. But the last time I was born of the Holy Ghost. And his wife came over. And I asked her, I said, do you believe that right across this little seal of Galilee, right over there in the Gadarene country, that when Jesus lived, there was a man that wouldn't keep any clothes on, and he'd cut himself in the day, and he'd cut himself in the night, and he'd cry in the day, and he'd cry in the night? And she said, no. I said, you don't believe that? She said, no. I, I said, well, I do believe it. So we had a crowd that shouted all the time, and they got out of their bed. Some of those men that night down there in that motel went down in the Sea of Galilee. Some of them climbed trees, and there's a shouting. Woke everybody up about 3 o'clock in the morning. Next morning, I went over to breakfast. That little lady professor from the University of Pennsylvania. I said, you still don't believe it? She said, not when Jesus lived. But I believe they come over here now that way. She said, I want to tell you something. Brother, you talk about shouters. We had them. We would be shaking the praise of the Lord. And thank God for his blessings. But I want to tell you, my friend, there's that the demon of violence. It'll cause a man to lose all sense of right and wrong. Here's a man that was violent. Bible said they'd bind him with chains and ropes and he'd break them. And one night, he looked across the Sea of Galilee and a little boat was headed that way. And on that boat was the calmer of the storm. And on that boat, bless God, was the master of the sea. And the Bible said that Jesus got out of that boat, started up the hill, and that man came down to meet Jesus. And did you know Jesus cast the legion of demons out of that man? And you know what happened? Those demons went in the swine. Well, you listen, demons have got to have a body to dwell in. They used to dwell in dogs, did you? I remember up home, dogs used to have fits. And uh, you, you don't hear of a dog having fits now in Chattanooga. There are too many human bodies they can get in. They don't have to dwell in dogs anymore. Oh, you say, preacher, how many of you heard of a dog having a fit? I remember up home, we used to the old dogs just go out and have fits, and then they start to die. Then they say, don't be around a dog like that when he starts to die. Those demons have got to go somewhere. When Jesus cast the demons out of the land of the gathering country, the Bible said those demons went into the swine, and the swine ran violently down the hill and drowned themselves. They committed homicide. Did you know that? They ran in, and bless your heart, they drowned themselves. But you know what happened to the fellow that had that violent spirit and that demon in him? He went home and got on some clothes. I like that. And the Bible said he had his right mind, and he came and sat at the feet of Jesus. When a man gets right with God, he'll come and sit at the feet of Jesus and enjoy the blessings of the Lord. It's good just to sit at the feet of Jesus and enjoy the blessings. But I've got to rush on. Let me give you another uh, demon. It's the demon of witchcraft or fortune telling. Now, you're somebody say, preacher, I go out to see these old fortune tellers. Listen to me. If you're turned to Leviticus 20 and verse 27, back in the Old Testament, God said to kill those with familiar spirits. Now, if you listen real closely, look this way, you can look that up when you get home. Listen. A wizard in the Bible was a male who had a familiar spirit. A witch in 
the Bible was a woman that had a familiar spirit. And the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy says, Beware of wizards and these that are witches and have familiar spirits. And somebody said, Well, I want to find out the future, Brother Mays. And I'll go down here and let old sister so and so read the palm of my hand or some tea leaves or a crystal ball. I'm glad I don't have to go to sister so and so. I can open up this Bible. It tells me where I've been. It tells me where I am and where I'm headed. Go it's a God you can't be sad. It tells me the conditions I'm going to live under. But you say, Preacher, oh, you'd be surprised the people in Chattanooga. You'd be surprised the people in Atlanta, Georgia, that are going to these wizards and to these fortune tellers. Well, I don't even care. And, 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 you know, some of my people are bad. I go to their homes, you know, and I visit some of my aunts and uncles and, and in-laws and outlaws, and I'll pick up the family Bible, and here's on one page is four-leaf clover. And all that stuff, I say, what are y'all doing with that in the Bible? Good Lord. I'll say, well, isn't that a shame? You can't trust God. You've got to trust luck. Let me tell you something. I'm not trusting in luck. I'm led by the Holy Ghost, and I'm kept by the power of God. And brother, I'm so glad I don't have to go by luck. Some of you here the other night, I remember I used to run buses years ago. Pick up those little ragged kids. And by the way, the other night I was preaching, and a young boy walked up and said, Brother Mays, when you pastor the church, I was a little ragged, dirty-faced, runny-nosed boy. And you picked me up in a bus and brought me this to church. And I heard about Jesus and said, I want to tell you, I'm pastoring the church now. And said, I've never gotten away from what you all did for me when you picked me up on the way. I said, glory to God. That's worth it all. Glory to God. One little old boy. That's ragged. But we used to pick up those little ragged kids and I try to be nice to them. And I would. I, I like kids. If you've ever seen me little kids, I'm joking with kids. I love children. You know, Jesus loved children. <laughs> Amen. Oh, yes, sir. He said, stop for the little children to come unto me. And if they'd pull out a marble, you know, what do you mean, old big marble? Say, hey, Brother Mays. He said, hey, you ever shoot marble? I said, no, not much. But you shoot marble? Yeah, I shoot marble. I said, is that a good one? Oh, I forget what they call that. But that's, that's a cheap one. You know, he'd knock them out of the room. I said, that's good. And uh, another come. I remember one little boy came in one Sunday morning. He said, Brother Mays, he pulled out a rabbit's foot. And he said, I want you to rub his rabbit's foot. <laughs> and I said, why? He said, he'll make you preach better. I thought, well, boy, I'll eat it. He'll do that. That was good, praise God. If he'll help me to preach better. But you know what that little boy said? I said, why do you say that? Oh, he said, I carry it all the time. He said, I never go anywhere without my rabbit's foot. He said, it's good luck. I said, son, you think with me just a minute. Rabbit had four of them. It didn't do him no good, did it? Amen. Listen to me. Run around talk about this luck business. I know some of you, if you let a black cat run across in front of you, you'll drive four miles to keep from going with that black cat. And you break a mirror and you say, seven years of bad luck. You wouldn't walk under a ladder. Listen, my friend, that's not the scriptural way to look at things. That's God, I'm not going by mirrors and black cats and ladders. I'm glad I'm going by the word of God and the power of God in the face of the Lord. But you say, what about these fortune tellers? Oh, the Bible tells them about one that got saved. And let me give you this, and I'll have to go on. I go with a man every year. His name's Ronnie Graves. I go with a man in Atlanta, Georgia. His name's Guy Ringwater. And uh, <laughs> Ronnie Graves is a gypsy. Uh, 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 Brother Guy Ringwater's an Indian. And I go with a son of Bob Darden. I don't know what he is. <laughs> had to get that on Bob today. I go with gypsies. And I go with Indians. And, and I remember last year when I was with that gypsy. I never for, will forget. We were going out to inspiration some with us. And I, I said to Martin, I said, well, I want to talk to that preacher. And so we went out to get something to eat after the service. And a sandwich. I sat down. And I looked at that gypsy. And I said, I want to talk to you. He said, well, I'll be glad to talk to you. Next night, I got to talk to him a little on the side of the church. As he said, it's the side door. And he said, I said to him, preacher, listen to that. You used to ride in a tr uh, caravan of gypsies. I said you were brought up as a gypsy. Your mother's a gypsy. Your daddy's a gypsy. And your people live in Nashville around Nashville. You're gypsies. I said, listen, Lonnie. I said, have you ever seen a gypsy that could really foretell the future? He stopped and paused just a moment. He said, gypsies are exactly what the name implies. They're gyp. He said, 99% of the gypsies are gyps. Because I was one before God saved me. He said, I was crooked, but said, Jesus, straighten me out. I saw glory to God. Uh, I wasn't a gypsy, but I was crooked. Jesus, straighten me out. Hallelujah. Brother, Jesus can straighten anybody out. And I looked at Brother Lonnie Graves, the dear man of God, 
runs 1,800 school lessons. That teacher runs 1,800 Now I said, Lonnie, I want to ask you something. And he said, what? I said, did you ever see a real gypsy that could tell fortunes? He said, I saw some demon-possessed gypsies that the devil actually had control of their fingers and their eyes and their bodies, and they were demon-possessed. And Brother Lee's, I believe they could really foretell the future. They had some knowledge because the devil gave them that knowledge. He said they were demon-possessed. And he said these that are real, these gypsies that are real, that can tell fortunes they are. He said, Brother Lee's real. But he said 99% of them are gypsies and they're crooks, and they know nothing about the future. I said to him, I said, well, I'm glad I never got tangled up with that witchcraft uh, and that fortune-telling business. Uh, oh, did you know there's 3,000 witches in the world that are registered witches? Uh, did you know there are hundreds of thousands of fortune-tellers around the world, uh, and people in these last days will be rushing to them? Now, quickly, let me give you something. Acts 16 said Paul the South had been down by the river, and he came up town. a little girl had a... A uh, spirit or a demon of fortune teller. And the scripture said Paul turned around and cast that demon up. And you know what she did? She got out of the fortune telling business. Uh, oh, that's why I know it's wrong. When she got the, the demon out of her, she quit telling fortunes. Uh, and so there's the demon of witchcraft and fortune. Now let me come to another. Real quickly, there's the demon of lust. My friend, that'll work on you. You listen to me. You women don't stop watching those old soap operas in the afternoon with all that lust oozing out and all that wickedness. Listen, there's a demon of lust in these last days. And of all you say, preacher me, listen, that demon of lust will work on you. That's right. It's a shame and disgrace. It's a shame and disgrace. Some people feast on the demon of lust. Now, you can't help what runs through your mind, but you listen to me. Demons can place in your mind evil. And I want to give you something, because I, I believe this is a fine congregation. You're the average congregation that I preach to, honest. And you're fine people. But if some of you ladies and some of you men were to have your thoughts up here on this, behind me, on, 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 on the, behind the pulpit, on a screen, oh, what you thought about last week, my friend, you'd have heart attack. Uh, oh, you say, why? Because there's a demon of lust. Uh, my Bible said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, seducing spirits. Uh, and certainly that's talking about not only that of religion, but also of lust. Uh, if you'll turn to Mark 16, verse 7, 8, 9, it talks about Mary Magdalene, uh, of whom Jesus cast seven devils out. And no doubt her passion, uh, and no doubt her sin was the sin of lust. Uh, oh, you say, preach amazing. Listen, 1 Timothy chapter 4, let's go back to that again. It says in there, and it says, forbidding them to marry. And this is going to, hey, this is your result. Now, listen to me. And if they forbid them to marry, it's going to promote homosexuality, and it's going to promote free love, and it's going to do away with the house, uh, the home, and it's going to do away with the sacredness of marriage and matrimony. My friend, it's a sad day when lust is invaded in pornography and motion pictures and television and the billboards and the newspapers and everything else is geared to the demons of lust. And people are being swept away. Listen, Romans chapter 1, I've got to go on. Listen to what it says. It said, and they'll turn the uh, man from the woman, and the woman will turn from the man to another woman. It's unnatural. Now, you read that. And I want to tell you something's going to happen around Chattanooga and Atlanta. And where, if you're not from Chattanooga or Atlanta, see, I'm from Atlanta and you're from Chattanooga, are, are they about listening to me? That they'll legalize homosexuality. Oh, yes, they're going to le legalize abortion. They're going to legalize everything. They're going to gonna do away with capital punishment. I want to tell you folks something. If we keep on going like we've been going for the last 20 years, this nation can't last much longer. We're headed for destruction. Now, you put that down. Somebody said, preacher, all this old homosexuality, let me give you something. When a person gets mixed up in that, listen, I don't believe they can be saved. I don't believe they can be born of the Spirit of God. When they get, the Bible said they're turned over to a reprobate mind. We better condemn it. We better stand against it. 
You say, Brother May, say, it's not much of that going on in Chattanooga. You need to wake up, sister. You need to wake up, mister. You need to get your eyes open. All over these campuses or these colleges and all over, except Christian colleges, you know they're not there, but all these other colleges and universities and, and these societies and societies. Listen, across this nation, you'll find that there's a sin, the unnatural affection that's growing by leaps and bounds, and nobody says anything about it. Let me give you a verse of scripture. Jesus said, Bless you to the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I believe we'd better plead for the blood in purity and keep holy things in your mind. Listen, the devil and demons shall run every kind of unholy desire through your mind. I've met people say, Oh, not through my mind. Don't come here with that. I'm not that stupid. You're not that stupid. If you're grown, you know that the devil runs things through your mind. Well, I'll face up to it. Quit trying to hypocrite about it. But there's one thing about it. We can look up and we can get our mind on holy things. And brother, when we have our minds on holy things, everything's all right. Yes, sir. Thank God. Blessed are the pure and hard for they'll see God. Let me come on. I want to give you two more demons. The demon of torment. Matthew 17 talks about a little boy that was tormented. Now, my friend, you can be tormented by demons. This little boy would fall on the ground. This little boy would foam at the mouth. This little boy would drive himself into the fire, and then he'd get out and he'd drive himself into the water. And the Bible said the disciples couldn't catch that demon of torment out of him. But Jesus came down, and Jesus did the job, and the little boy was no more tormented by that tormented demon. And my friend, when Jesus, oh, thank God, Jesus has more power than demons. But you may be tormented. You may be, you, let me give you that demon, that demon of torment will make you do things you don't want to do. Let me give you this. Old drunk out here, he quit drinking every weekend. I'll never stop back by the bar. But he always stops back by the bar when he gets his back. Oh, that woman that's filled with lust and that man that's filled with lust says, I'll never go to one of those sex parties again. But they're driven back. You say, what is it? It's the demon of torment. And oh, only the word of God and only the word of Christ. Now let's come to the last demon. And I'll have to close. Listen, there's the demon of religion. Over in First John 4, 1, it talks about that spirit and believe not every spirit. And if you'll turn to Matthew 23, Jesus talks about the scribes and the Pharisees. They had the demon of religion. Let me tell you something. This religion in this country is wrecking this nation. Religion without salvation is a dangerous thing. And a demon can get in you and make you clean up and reform and shake the preacher's hand and join the church and go to hell from a church pew. That's a demon of religion, if you hear me. And brother, there's so many today that have let the demon of religion rob them from knowing Jesus and the new birth and being passed from death unto life. I meet so many people and say, I'm a Baptist. I am too, but I'm saved. Glory to God. I meet somebody and say, I'm a Methodist. You ought to be a saved Methodist. You will say, listen, we find out, oh, the devil of religion. And the demon of religion is sending more people to hell than Chattan in Chattanooga than any other demon. You read it when you get home. Matthew 23, Bible said those demons of religion got those folks to fasting. They wear black clothes. And I, believe, I don't care what color you just so you got enough on. Amen? I believe you ought to put enough on. I'm not saying about the color. I just want you to have enough on. And I believe, bless God, we need to come. But they did all this, but they were lost. You'd meet them over in Jerusalem, fasting. Why well, won't he do a thing on the Lord? A Sabbath day. Here he goes with his faith twisted from fasting. Here he is, very religious. But oh, religious, but lost. A religious thing was in him. Let me mention one other thing about this religious thing. He gets in these preachers that have never been saved, never been called, and they want to be religious and get up and pastor a church, and they are filled with a religious demon. They've never been born again. They've never had the call of God. That's the reason we've got these false prophets over America that are preaching everything but the blood and the the new birth and the Holy Ghost and the second coming. My friend, they got a demon of religion in them. It's a sad thing. Let me give you this, and then I'll give you three things you can do about demons, and we'll go. I was in Athens, Georgia, several years ago. Went to this home with this pastor, and he said, this widow that's coming out to the door said her husband was in a certain denomination. He died and went to hell. And I said, what'd you say, preacher? 
He said, that preacher died and went to hell. He said, now I'll show you something when I get in there. So the lady opened the door and the preacher said, how do you do? He said, this is Brother Mays. You want to see him? He's here with me in a meeting. She said, come in, Reverend. Real nice, precious lady. I went in. She said, I I'd like to go back and get you some refreshment. And the preacher said, all right, because he wanted to go back. They wanted to tell me something. But she left the door open. And he, took, he kept motion in the bedroom. He said, <laughs> I looked over there, beside that bed. We got out after we had the refreshments. He said, the reason I want you to look beside that bed, that preacher was dying, preacher. And he fell out of the bed and was choking to death. He said, his wife, my God, I preached to others and I'm not saved. A religious demon made me clean up and made me make out like I was a Christian and a called man of God and said, I'm dying and going to hell because I've been deceived by the religious demon. He said, Preacher, by that bed, that man died and went to hell. Oh, you say, Brother Mays, was something. there's such a thing as a religious demon. Now, let me give you three things you can do and we'll close. Number one, you can plead the word of God. Matthew 8, 16 says, and Jesus spoke and cast out demons. Brother, there's more power if this word is quick and powerful and sharp than any two-edged sword. Next time you feel oppressed or bothered by demons, open up the book and begin to read the precious word of God. I'm glad by the word of God. Matthew 8 and verse 16. And then by the blood. And it's found in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. Talking about Satan. It says they overcame him and it also means his kingdom. They overcame him by the word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb. Thank God we can plead the blood. I can stand him in power. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. What can give you victory over demons? Nothing but the blood and the word. And then here's the third. The precious Holy Spirit. That Jesus said greater is he that's in you than he that's of the world. And I'm so glad that if you're saved, inside of you is the precious Holy Ghost. And greater is he that's in you than he that's of the world. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm glad there's victory through Christ. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. very important. Anytime you preach on demons, demons fight you. Anytime you preach on demons, you'll have trouble. I've been preaching on demons on Sunday afternoon for about the last four Sunday afternoons, and brother, it's not easy. But I don't want people to go out ignorantly of the work of this unseen kingdom, the army of Satan called demons. And I just mentioned seven today, and there are millions of them. They'll torment you, friend. Oh, yes, maybe some of you today have a religious demon. You thought you were saved, but you don't know whether you are saved or not. We're sitting at a table today down at Brother Tom's, and I always laughing and talking, and I, I, I knew that Tom's oldest, our youngest girl, got saved Monday night. Brother Tom, who's listening in while I'm talking right now, said, Brother May, she'd been thinking she was saved for 13 years. So 13 years she'd been going to Sunday school, thought she was saved. But Monday night she really got saved. Now listen, 13 years! I don't know, she might have come most of those years right here to this church. That's not, but they're all over Chattanooga going to churches. And they think they're saved, but they're not born again. They're not saved with the blood. And my friend, they made a profession, but they do not have a possession. What a sad thing it is to be deceived by a religious demon. Let me ask you something. My friend, how's it with your soul? Let me ask you something. How is it? How is it? Are you saved and do you know it? Are you sealed with the Holy Ghost? Can you put the whole armor of God on to withstand against the wiles of the devil? Oh, you better think about this. You better think about it. Think about it. Now, there are three things I'm going to ask you. Then we're going to have Brother lead us in a song. And we're going home. Just Two standards in just a moment. Now, number one, how many of you here today say, Brother Mays, I know without a shadow of a doubt that everything's right with God and everything's on the blood? I know it! Lift up your hand, let me see it. Would you hold it up high? Thank you. God bless you. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Blessed. Amen. Now you can take your hands down. Let me ask you the second question real quickly. How many of you say, Preacher? 
I couldn't raise my hand then. I won't raise it up now. Would you sit it up and let me, Brother Bob, pray for you right there in your seat quickly? Would you hold it up? Lift it up. Then you can take it down. Let me see it. I want you to lift it up and let me pray for you. Let Brother Bob pray for you. Would you hold up your hand? While we wait just a moment, hold up that hand. Can, yes, God bless you, sir. Here's another. You better be sure about this thing, friend. God's dealing with folks right here this Sunday afternoon. Hold up your hand. Let me see it. Here's another. Here's another anywhere in the house. Let me see your hand. Lift it up. All right. Let me ask you the third. This is the one I, I want you to be sure to answer me. I, I've been bothered by demons, as I said, more in the last 30 days since I've been preaching against them and exposing them. I'm going to ask you this third question. I want you to be honest. Have you been bothered by demonic power, demons, in the last 30 days or maybe the last six months? Have they attacked your mind, your body? your nerves? Have, have you had trouble with demons bothering you? Listen, if you have, I want you to be honest. Just step up your hand. Let me see it today. I want to pray for you. If you've had trouble, now come on, that's right. Be honest today. No use a hypocrite about it. If you, listen, you will have trouble if you if you don't acknowledge your need of help. And I acknowledge mine. I know what to do. I, I gave you, all right, thank you. I imagine 20, 25, maybe 30, maybe 35 people raise your hand. Anybody else say, preacher? I've been bothering with them lately. I want victory. I want to claim the blood and the word, power of the Holy Ghost. Yes, God bless you. 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 Amen. God bless you. That's right. Let's acknowledge it. And we, we can get help. Listen, you'll never get help till you're willing to acknowledge you need it. God will never cram anything down you, but you need help. Come on. Let's God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Quick. God bless you. God bless you. All right, now we're going to have a special prayer. A special prayer for you that have been troubled by this, these demons and demoniac power. I want you to get up right where you are. I want you to slip right out in the aisle and come down here and let's kneel. We're going to have preachers. and That's right, we're, we're going to pray. We're, we're going to get victory. Amen, that's right. There's no use for you to have that pressure, that strain, smothering, that fearfulness that comes. And I'm glad there's victory. Thank God. That's why we bring, I bring these messages that you can get help. Right. Now, if we can't get help, why we didn't? That there's nothing accomplished on this right. Sunday afternoon. We just wasted our time. Anybody else? Do you need help? Come on. You can find a way at this altar. Thank God we can get help today. Amen. Now there now. Just back. That's right. Just kneel in the aisle. Come on out in the aisle. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. I will make a move forward. Come on out in the eye. Amen. That's right. Friend, you can get to victory here today. Oh, I'm glad. Amen. Anybody else? Just come out in the aisle, as Brother Bob had said, and let's kneel. All right. I want the preachers right where they are to kneel. I want every preacher to plead the blood, to stand on the Word, yeah. and trust the Holy Ghost to seal folks up here today with victory Amen. against these demon powers. Amen. Folks, let me say this to you. Now, you think I preach rough, and I'm not apologizing, but you never know what your little girl goes through with down there at school and the demons are on her. You'll never know what your, you listen, you'll never know what your husband, your wife faces where they work. The powers of demons the darkness is settling in. We'd better get God on the scene. We'd better get God on us and get the touch of God on us. We'd better get God on us today. We'd better not be satisfied with anything else than the touch of God. I'm going to ask Brother Bob to lead this prayer while the rest of the preachers pray. Let's really get a hold of God. Brother Bob, you lead us. Our Heavenly Father, we bow today in the name of our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus. Yeah. We are grateful today that truly greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I recognize because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, the devil cannot get possession of our bodies. And I recognize, Lord, from without he oppresses and oppresses us. I pray, God, for everyone that's in this altar place and here in the house today. Oh, God, might the Holy Spirit give them the deliverance that they need in this hour. I pray I 
our fathers that you'd speak to them. I pray, dear God, drive out these alien forces yes. and drive them back, Lord, that the Holy Spirit might have complete charge of our hearts and our lives. Lord, to tell us in your word, oh, God, we're to think on good things. I pray, dear God, these that the devil has tormented their minds. Oh, Spirit of God, I pray that you might help them to fortify themselves by thinking about good things. Lord, and when they begin to think about evil things, to fall and pray and depend on the Holy Spirit that's with them, that he might give deliverance. And then, Father, I pray God today that you speak to all, dear God, whatever it is, Lord. There may be some here, God, that's not sure they've been saved. How might they recognize you're not the God of confusion? Might they recognize, Lord, that you always deal in the open? And our Father, I pray, I ask that they might look to you and know today, oh, Spirit of God, have your way right now. I come, dear Lord, to plead the blood of Jesus, our blessed Savior, against the, the devil and his uh, and his allies. Our Father, I pray today, move in our hearts. You said in your word, Lord, that if we had believing that it would be granted. And Lord, we just want to rest on the word and know that you'll do the work today. And so, Father, right here, I pray, cleanse every heart and free every life. You said in your word, if we confess our sins, and Lord, the doubt is still, and Lord, the yield is sin, I pray, right here, just simply today, please will confess, dear God, and Lord, have you to cleanse their lives. And then, Father, I pray, bless now in this hour, get glory to the name of Jesus. I'll thank you for all you do for us. I ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. Oh, Amen. 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 Yeah, stay here again. Amen. Now, I believe the Lord's accomplished what have because I believe there's a lot of folks that need help along these lines today. But I want us to stand a moment and sing one stanza. Perchance there's somebody here today and you're lost and you're on your way to hell and you may not have another chance to get right. Now, friend, if you're here today and you're lost and you know you're lost, if I was you, I'd run to this altar and fall in here and ask for mercy. While there is mercy, I'd ask God for grace while grace is still available. I'd get saved. I'd trust in Jesus as my Savior. What are we going to sing? Nothing but the blood. Let's sing just one stanza. Then we'll pray and go back for the service tonight. We don't want to keep you too long. Brother Bob's standing right here. Though if you're not saved, we want you to come. Would you do it while we sing one stanza, Nothing But the Blood? All right, while we sing, just come out on. Wait. Because every time you preach it, demons work on you. But 
will check this tape. I've even had tapes, uh, one tape I made on this, and it went blank for a while while I was preaching. Just nothing on the tape. It's going along fine. There's nothing on it. Somebody said, that's strange. That's not strange if you know what I'm preaching about this afternoon. That's strange if you don't know what I'm preaching about. Say, but that's not strange to me because the devil does that. He wants to do anything. Now, uh, we'll be announcing it on uh, WDODFM when we have it ready. Uh, on the back is a study on demons and some things on demons that you need to know about. Now, tonight, you that it will be in your churches, you pray. And then you that can be here, call up somebody who's not saved. We want to pull the net. And we want to see a lot of people get saved tonight. We've had somebody saved in every night service. And I believe this morning, yeah, we had folks saved this morning. Every service, except this one and I, and this one's when we try to get help to those that need help that have been oppressed and obsessed by demons. Now, you'll be back with us tonight, 7.30 if you can. If not, you pray and ask God to bless. We'll be praying for you. And I appreciate you coming and being with us in the afternoon service. All right, Brother Bob, before we go.